that the person will come on the other side of writing a book. What sort of book it is? It can be a business book, it can be a memoir, it can be anything. It can be a children's book. The process of writing will change your life. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Artist and Author Hour. I'm your host, Tony Lontis, and I'm delighted to have you listening and watching us today. We have a beautiful, amazing guest to have a chat to. But before we get on with that, just a reminder that if you're watching this live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, or the Everyday Women's Network, you will find talking notes and points and ways to connect with our guest attached to the show notes. A reminder too that Everyday Women's Network has its own Apple app, Android app, and soon to be released via TV, which means you can watch across all smart TVs and your iPhone, laptop and desktop. If you miss any of these amazing shows, don't forget you can catch up anytime on Everyday Women's Network or on our YouTube channel. And welcome to anyone listening on YouTube live today. Each and every week we have amazing authors from across the globe and today is no different. Before we start with this wonderful conversation, I want to acknowledge the people of the Yugamba language region on the Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. <clears throat> Pardon me. It's, um, uh, past, present and emerging and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders listening or watching today. My humble apologies. Uh, my voice has been on and off great for the last couple of weeks and during that very important component of our show, it decided it was going to have a crack. Anyway, today we are talking to an amazing human called Rev Alfred and the topic of our conversation today is around mental health, suicide and trauma. So I want to remind our audience today, if anything in the program triggers something in you, no matter what that emotion is, please reach out and talk to someone. Find a support person, make sure you connect. Do not allow it to go unnoticed. If you're having a reaction to anything we talk about, it's an important part of your body going, there's something I need to deal with here. And because we're talking about trauma and healing today, it's important that you understand that triggers are a normal part of trauma processing and healing. And there are ways in which you can deal with them that are helpful and help you to lead a happy and whole life. And so today's guest, Rev, lost her mum when she was 22 years old after many years of suicidal ideology. She tried to put this grief behind her without processing it and she forged on to create a successful business with her husband and her three children and built an amazing life. Eventually, as we all know, or those of us that have been down this path, there comes a point of reckoning where we have to deal with that trauma and deal with that grief. Eventually, the events of a life led to um, a challenges raising her children with health issues and it affected Rev's own mental health. She came to a point where she could no longer run and was forced to face the realities of the past. And she found that path to healing and that's what we want to highlight today. Rev has just written a powerful memoir on the impacts and effects of generational trauma on her life and that of her children's. She's an advocate for raising awareness around mental health and bringing a light to the suffering that often happens in the dark. 
And from my perspective, it definitely happens in a very dark place. And you can be a credibly high-functioning adult and still be in the depths of darkness in your quietest moments. So I want to um, introduce today to our show, Rev Alford. Good morning, Rev. Good morning, Tony. Thank you so much for having me on and for that amazing introduction. Um, I'm really looking forward to having this chat today. I'm delighted any time that I get to talk to someone who has been through and walked through trauma in whatever that looks like. And today I have to pay tribute to you for your vulnerability in wanting to talk on an interview that takes incredible courage. And I want to pay tribute to the bravery that it takes to write a book, particularly a memoir. Um, from that place of vulnerability and the reasons why we do that and I've written my own memoir why and that's why what Rev has done is so powerfully um, important for us to talk about because I've been, been down this path as well. Rev I thought today that we'd start with one of your favorite quotes and it's a wonderful one it's got it goes you have to keep breaking your heart until it opens by Rumi. Can you tell us what that quote means to you, Rev? Absolutely. Um, this is the quote that I put on the inside cover of my book um, and I chose it because it just resonated so much with me and I absolutely love Rumi's um, poetry yes. and, you know, it just really speaks to me. So this particular quote has so many different levels and meanings for different people, but for me, I went into sort of survival mode and, um, you know, I just existed and, yeah. you know, and I kept getting my heart break, you know, my heart kept breaking over and over and everything that kept happening, I just kept going and kept surviving and kept going until eventually, um, you know, I had this realisation and that, and I believe that's when my heart opened and it was that, you know, that everything that I needed was within me and and I was looking externally and in the survival mode and, and looking externally for validation and love and then it wasn't Absolutely. until my heart opened that I, that I finally realised that I did have all of the answers within me. So that quote is an absolute metaphor for my life. Amazing. This wonderful memoir and congratulations on writing it. Um, it's very real and raw, um, beautifully written. Can we talk about the courage that it takes to write about tough things, in particular trauma and healing? And can we talk about the reasons why you're so passionate about this memoir? Absolutely. It was extremely difficult to write. And, and when I started writing, I didn't write it with the intention of publishing it. I wrote it um, just for part of my healing and to sort of put my whole life in one, you know, chapter, I suppose, and, and to just get it all out, to get it all out of me. And as I wrote it, I realised it sort of had more of an awakening of wow I have been through a lot and and it's amazing it's an amazing healing experience when you put it all on paper and you do see what you've been through and how far you've come um I also because I lost my mum when I was 22 when yeah. I was raising my children I had so many questions about you know what I was like as a child and um how I was raised and I didn't have anyone to ask like I couldn't ask and so that was quite a difficult process for me and I think I wanted I didn't want my children to have that I wanted them to know um, you know more about their history and about my life and about the way I raised them and how I raised them and why I raised them like I did and I mm -hmm. wanted it all on paper for them so that they you know will never have to think about you know what it was like they know it's all written in a book so they were the main reasons why I decided to write it and yeah. it wasn't until I finished writing it and sort of a year later um, as I did more healing and more work that I finally yes. decided yes I want to get this out there I, I think it's time and I think the, the biggest reason was that I feel like we need to talk about mental health and we need to have more open discussion around it because I do believe a lot of people suffer in silence and um, 
are too afraid because there is a stigma associated with it. So they're too afraid to, to speak up and say, you know, I'm struggling and I'm not dealing with this. And I think that is the biggest motivation for me as hard as, as it is to speak about and talk about. And even for me, like admitting that I had meant my own mental health issues and oh, yes. you know, my own mental breakdown, like it was so hard and so confronting, but also really healing. So it was something that I needed to do for me and also to, to, to open up that dialogue and make it okay for others to do that as well. Um, in talking about um, healing from my own perspective, that writing about what you've been through is a, a powerful healing component. And um, I remember one, one of my psychologists saying, how about you start journaling? And that was kind of the start and I'd written diaries most of my life. We used to, as a teenager, write in my diary. But it wasn't until I started to actually write those words that I started to find different components of, of the healing. And um, that still, that healing continues today as you unpack further elements of what the trauma in your life was about. Rev, we talked um, in the intro about your mum. Are you comfortable to just talk to us today about what it was like with mum's suicidal ideology and her own mental health struggles and what her mental health, the trauma that's that led to her own mental health uh, issues? Yeah, I do. I believe it's really important to talk about. Um, so my mum was quite a strict, um, you know, mum when, when I was younger and mm-hmm. quite controlling and mm-hmm. um, she was of German descent, like she was born in Germany and my grandparents were German. So they were very strict and controlling and, and everything had its place. And that was how I was raised early on. Mm-hmm. And when I was 14, um, I was told my mum had an angina attack, but I did later find out that that was a panic attack that led to panic disorder so that was the catalyst for for everything changing and that was sort of the first Mm -hmm. moments that I realized that things weren't quite as they seemed Um, even though I wasn't told at the time I still knew that there was more going on than what you know what I had been told and um, and I think from there that, you know, it was interesting because in some ways she changed and she she became less controlling and she really worked mm-hmm. on herself and her relationship with me. Um, so she became really loving and mm-hmm. she kind of did it, you know, a 180 in terms of how she parented me. Yes. Um, but the other side to that was that her mental health started to decline further and further. And I think that... Um, because of the trauma she had been through as a child, she re- she'd she recovered some repressed memories about her childhood sexual abuse. And um, and I think from that age onwards, at the, as the memories came back to her, um, she was struggling and dealing with that trauma. And so as she was doing the healing and improving herself, she also had a lot going on and a lot to deal with and a lot to unpack and that sort of became more evident over the years and then sort of late in my late teens her mental health deteriorated further and she became suicidal and um and and did you know that she was at the age that you were did you understand um that suicidal ideology, did did she talk about it to you or is that just um, a reflection now that you're an adult? She did start, as I got older, sort of she did definitely start to share that more with me. When I was around 16 years of age, she stopped contact with my grandparents because she believed her father sexually abused her as a child. So around that time she did share with me what was going on not in great detail um but yeah she definitely told me so I did know and that was quite a difficult time for me because up to that point I had no idea and thought he was just you know the bee's knees I absolutely loved him he you know he spent a lot of time with me as a child so it was a difficult time for me too because absolutely um, you know I absolutely believed her but it's it, it was wasn't the person that I knew so that was quite difficult and 
Yeah, as she around sort of my later teens when she became more suicidal and she had quite a lot of suicide attempts, um, oh. she was very open with me at that point. And I think it was because she was in survival mode. She, you know, mm -hmm. she was fighting for her life. And I became a carer for her in and um, our roles reversed in some ways. And so um, she was definitely more open because there, there was no, yeah. you know, she couldn't hide it at that point. Yeah. So, yeah, it definitely became a big part of my life was trying to keep her alive. Yeah. Rev, I just want to touch on, um, again, very close to my own personal st story, that recovery of repressed memories. For people who don't understand is that as a child, if you've had trauma and that trauma can be in many different formats, but your brain is an amazing vehicle for protecting you. And what it does as a child is protect you from having to deal with that particular trauma. But in doing so, it means that later in life, usually, and often, Rev, it can be quite later in life. I've, I've talked to people who have recovered memories in their 70s, wow. 60s, 70s and 80s. Um, for many women, though, that recovery process kind of happens in the years between your 30s and your 50s from the people that I've talked to. Now, the understanding and discovery of memories is incredibly difficult and it's almost traumatic in its on its on its own discovering oh my goodness that dream that i was having was actually real and it means this this and this children process those memories from a childlike perspective and it's often not until we're an adult and we understand oh my goodness that, oh wow that 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 happened that's not okay. And the discovery of that then starts or usually kickstarts the process. Um, I wanted to talk about that intergenerational trauma because in your mum discovering um, and understanding what happened to her in childhood, not only does she have to process that childhood, but there's a whole lifetime after that and the impact on the children. Can you talk to us about that? Because I think it's really important that we have conversations about the impacts of intergenerational trauma. And what I'm talking about is when um, an adult, a mum or a grandparent has suffered trauma, there's not a lot of healing or counselling or help. And that is passed on to the generations after them. Can you talk about that from your perspective, Rev? Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. And um, I'm sure that my, you know, mum's parents had their own trauma and and that is why, you know. It's, it's linked that together. It is, if, yes. If someone is abused, you can absolutely almost 100% say that there's trauma in that background. Yeah, and it definitely. may not it may not be uh, sexual abuse, although often it is. It could be uh, physical or war or whatever it is. Absolutely. But it's there's an inherent link between trauma and childhood sexual abuse yeah, and it's passed definitely. down the generations. We know that, don't we? Absolutely, yeah. And, and obviously my mum, you know, did uncover these repressed memories and had so much trauma that she had to deal with. So, you know, by the time that happened, we, you know, I was born and I was, you know, she was my yeah. mother. So that had a huge impact on, on the way she parented me and, yes. and I wasn't offered a lot of support because my mum was in survival mode um, yeah. and just trying to keep herself alive. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, the way she parented me was pretty much, you know, she wasn't to control overly present. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and not overly to present. Keep and you not, safe. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. To to protect me from what yeah. she was going through. But in doing that, I was kind of left left alone. And so, you know, I had feelings of being not heard and not seen See. and being invisible. And, you know, and I was raised kind of like kids 
uh, seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. And so that had a huge impact on the, you know, how I shaped my personality and how I grew up and how I dealt with things. So, um, you know, and then also when I had children, how that affected how then I raised them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I thought that I would do it differently. I, you know, but you can't think your way out of trauma, you know. That's right. You can't, that's an important, you cannot think your way out of trauma you you actually can't do it yourself you actually need to rely or allow yourself or or, uh, a part of that discussion is around caring enough about yourself to allow yourself to help let others help you yes absolutely you cannot think it as you just said you you cannot think your way through it you need a separate fully trained person to walk you through that process absolutely Um, and I think I I thought I could like that was my motto I'm going to do it differently I'm not going to be like her and Mm -hmm. then you know as it turns out my life mirrored her in so many ways so as much as I (laughs) hoped and believed that I would do it differently yeah it didn't work out that way Rev, can I ask just about um, your relationship with your grandparents? Obviously, your mum stayed in contact with them for a fair part of your life and you were encouraged to have a relationship with them. How did that relationship change once you knew and understood the source of your mum's trauma? How did that impact you? What, What were your thoughts and how did you navigate that? Yeah, that was, you know, a really hard part of my childhood because Mm. we were very close with them growing up and we had, you know, a fairly small family and I would spend a lot of time there, Mm. um, you know, and, you know, I can remember as a child spending, you know, hours playing board games with my grandfather and, you know, and I absolutely loved my Nana. She was a really loving, nurturing figure in my life. So, you know, I have a lot of memories of when I was young and they're just so lovely and, you know, just I have so much love for for those times. So in my teens when my mum shared this with me and yes. how um, she ceased all contact with them and also um, so that meant that my contact was also ceased. So I had nothing to do with them once she decided that. So that so we lost contact with them for a few years. Yeah. Um, and then my grandfather got cancer and my mum reconciled with them again. Oh. And so they did he did come back into my life very briefly just before he died. But I think for me, there was a real disconnect with him. I couldn't, I, I had nothing yes. for him. I couldn't, yes. I couldn't reconnect with him how I had as a child. Because, yeah, because of everything tainted. that had happened and I'd heard, you know, I knew what had happened to my mom. My mum needed to reconnect before he died and needed to have that, but I didn't. And I think it was a really hard time because my mum wanted us to kind of be close with him again, but I didn't feel that at all. Yeah. So it was hard. It's incredibly hard um, because that's similar to my own experience, knowing and understood, understanding that my mum was, um, had some trauma in her life, but not, uh, knowing that that trauma was at the hands of um, her father yes. and yeah. having a, a partial relationship and then thinking, well, why didn't you keep us away, away from yes. them yep. and all of that that, yep. that unpacks. And the only, the only way that I can think about it in my own mind is that you – my mum, like your mum, was in survival mode and protecting yes. herself and she she did the best that she could and that's all there is to it, you know? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. And I think I understand that now as an animal and but, since I've found that compassion again, I definitely, yes, absolutely. Yes. And, yeah. and that's another key point to make with our, um, our audience today is there is a process for yes. unpacking and dealing with trauma and there's no going around it. You only can walk through it. And absolutely, some of us can walk right through it, but other people get stuck in certain components and that's 
actually human experience and there's no right or wrong is there no that's it definitely it took me a long time and and I think and it you know resonate with what you're saying is that's that's the human journey that's what we're going through so and that recovery and healing process takes so much longer than we think um, and I just I want to point out something for the audience today and, and Rev, um, I want to talk about um, just momentarily Grace Tame. Now, the reason I bring this up is because here's a 26-year-old dealing with a trauma that happened in her late 20s and having this public persona and me from my own knowledge and understanding, knowing that she's still going through that healing process and will probably be for the rest of her life, but she still has to show up and have a life. And it's the same for all of us Absolutely. that are dealing with trauma. Definitely. You still have a life. Life yep. still goes on. It doesn't stop while you deal and heal. Exactly. You have to work yeah. out a way to navigate through that. Absolutely. Um, and I think even as me as a 46 year old now, yes. I it, it's not like I haven't reached a point where I can say it's all, I'm all great and it's done. Like I no, think this will be a process for me for my whole life. And I agree. Yeah. I think that, I that's thought important. I thought naively to that I would, I would be healed at some stage. Yeah. I now know that there will always be components and things that pop up that I go, oh, wow. Oh, all right. <laughs> Absolutely, definitely. As much as okay. we don't want that to happen, it Let's happens. Unpack this. We just can get better at at unpacking and dealing with it. I and was just going to say okay. that's that's part of the skills you learn in dealing and healing. Absolutely, the skills of recognizing. Okay, I'm going to a low place now. What's that about? What do I need to do? What keeps me safe? And even learning and understanding that is a is takes a while it does um going back to your your beautiful mum um and I want to point out something about suicidal ideology because I've lived that as well and it's not so much the way or about ending your life it's about stopping a level of pain that makes you non-functioning isn't it Absolutely. And yeah, I, I understand that more so now as an adult, definitely the amount of pain she was in. It, like it I is really understand. The deepest, yeah. darkest, most horrible pain a human could endure. And you just want the pain to stop. At that point, you're not thinking about um, what happens after, what what you leave, who will be hurt. You just want the pain to stop. And it's in that moment that you can actually get help. And But it's conversely in that moment when most people don't get the help that they need. Yeah, definitely. And I think because there is such a stigma too around mental health, and especially 23 years ago, I think now. Definitely. Um, that there, there wasn't the support there. There yeah, wasn't. So, um, definitely wasn't. My mum had been in and out of, of hospital, you know, many times and, and I think her case was just too too much for people in some ways, um, you know. So I think that, um, you know, it is those moments and it's those moments where they need the most help and it's yeah. unfortunately 23 years ago that, that wasn't there, mm-hmm. that support wasn't there or available to her. Rev, from your experience, did you have any... Um, understanding around when she reached that point of I'm going to end my life I had she did speak to me probably maybe three or four months before she passed uh-huh. away um, she sat me down for a really you know in-depth conversation about it and I could see she'd sort of been preparing that for a while uh-huh. and it was in that conversation that she really shared with me a lot of what had happened to her as a child uh-huh. and um, explained where she was at and and what was really going on and and I think that conversation really showed me and, and sort of hit home to me how how severe Mm -hmm. it was and how you know 
how bad it it is for her. So I, I'm glad I had that conversation with her and, um, you know, really grateful, I guess, because as an adult now at the time, no, not so much. I didn't really yeah. understand, but as an adult now looking back, yeah. you know, reflection I could see. is a, is a, yes. a powerful tool for healing because yes. if you can look back and be compassionate with the person that you were at that time and with, with your mum in particular, uh, I actually think it's incredibly courageous of her to re-engage with her father um, at the end of Absolutely. that. That is yes, definitely. so brave. Exactly. And, you know, looking back as an adult to, to just think how she did that and to, to want to be able to forgive him and and that would, would have been part of her healing, that forgiveness, and she did that. So, wow. like, that's I, amazing. Yeah, it, and it? she I remember at his funeral, you know, she was there and openly grieving and loving and so I know on her healing she did get, you know, she had so many breakthroughs. She she yes. was so close, you know. Yes. So, um, and and I know that now. I didn't know that at the time, but I I know now, looking back, that she was so close to getting there. And you know, I met up with her therapist two years ago just to get oh, some insight man. into all of this. And she shared with me that they had so much hope for her. They really believed she was going to make it and going to get through it and um and I, it, it's hard to hear that oh. now because knowing she didn't but it does give me hope to think that you know how brave and how uh, courageous uh, yeah that was for her to, to get to, to get so far in her healing oh I just just to let the audience know as, as Rev's talking I uh, just uh, I, I have a vision of her mum and I, I don't know your mum at all, but it's just such a powerfully beautiful vision of, of that healing and the ability that tr- takes tremendous effort and healing to forgive. I know from my own perspective, I'm not at that point just at the moment. And I know that it's something I want to get to, but the getting to it is so hard. It is. The surrender and the letting go. Um, Rev, in in my notes um, reading about your story, you talk about the disassociation after mum's suicide. Um, Can we talk about disassociation? Because, again, another topic close to my heart, understanding that disassociation is a beautiful protection mechanism of your mind. So can you explain disassociation from your perspective in your life, Rev? Absolutely. That, I think, goes back to the year after mum passed away, and that was such a traumatic time for me because a huge part of my life had been um, helping her stay alive Um, so it pretty much consumed everything I did you know there for her a lot yes so after she passed away it was everything that I knew had gone because as tough as that life was that's all I knew Um, and Mm -hmm. so after she'd gone I had just the most horrific year trying to deal with that. Uh And, you know, I went through, you know, all of the stages of grief um, and just this emptiness. And I just felt like my whole world had fallen apart and I felt this massive hole in my heart. And I honestly didn't know if I would ever be able to get past that. And I think a year later, I finally had a moment and I said to myself, I can continue along the path that she took and, you know, I could possibly end up exactly like she is or Mm -hmm. I could make something of my life and I could Mm -hmm. step up and I could not let mental health affect me and I could, you know, soldier on and be strong and be brave and be powerful and make it, you know, make something of my life. And I think I decided in that moment that that's what I was going to do. And then in some ways I disassociated from what happened. I found my anger towards my mum. I I was used that anger to to go forward um and to not look back Mm -hmm. and I became angry with her for what she had done rather than looking at Mm -hmm. her from compassion I 
looked at her from my anger and I was angry that she left me and I was angry for the way, you know, she created this life where I was the one looking after her as opposed to her looking after me and I was just so angry and so that fueled me to move forward. I was just going to say, Rev, and that is a powerful component of healing and recovery is anger and it's about what you do with that anger, how you disperse it, because it can be very destructive, can't it? It can, yeah. And and I think using that anger helped me disassociate because I said, yep. I'm not going to look back. I'm not going to waste my energy on, you know, my mum because she chose to leave me. So I um, that, that made it easy. It made it easy to disassociate and move forward. And yep. from that moment on, I did not look back. Yeah. Um, and I created an amazing life for myself, you know, and, and yeah, I considered let's myself. talk about that, right? Yeah, I considered myself really lucky from that moment on because I did meet, uh, you know, an amazing man um, a couple of years after she died and uh-huh. he is the most, like we're still married today, he's the most yes. amazing man and we, you know, travelled the world together yeah. before we settled down and, you know, we got to see some amazing things mm-hmm. and he was so patient with me because I was not in a good way and he just allowed me to heal and yeah. gave me the love I think that I, I had been missing. Like I, mm-hmm. you know, I don't even know how he put up with me, to be honest, because I was just like so There's insecure. and something special about unconditional love in the story of healing and dealing with trauma um again if you have an unconditional loving person in and around you your ability to heal and deal is exponentially better someone who is patient amazing loving kind and understanding you will heal and not every one of us has that that person although you can have a wonderful relationship with a counsellor or or, um, psychologist that will move you through in the same way but let's not underestimate the power of unconditional love in this healing story yeah definitely and I think that you know he didn't realize at the time Mm. but he he saved me yeah he he has no idea yeah Yeah. but he did he saved me and and just the amount of love he had for me and he saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself at the time so you know I'm really grateful that we crossed paths because you know we have built an amazing life together um yeah, we got married. We started our own business, yes. um, and that supported What's us. What's your business, Rev? It's commercial air conditioning. Oh yes, yes. So it's yeah. more in his field, but yeah, you know, but, but I still I do. ran the the admin yeah. side of it, and he yep. did the technical side. So between yep. the two of us, we're a great team, and you know, we've built that up over mm. you know twenty odd years now, and it. it it supports us financially and allows me to do what I want to do and and allows me to follow my passions, which, which, which has been good, really good for my healing. Absolutely. Don't underestimate the, the, the point that you are um, in time at the moment. And I'm going to go on just a slight tangent at the moment, but I actually have a powerful belief that the women in our age group have wonderful amazing messages and and we have been given almost a unique opportunity to heal and nurture the world and it's about the storytelling and it's about the healing process and it's about the rise of feminine energy and essence which is nurturing and healing and to be able to talk about these stories so openly um, in this day and age and to use the technology to get these stories out to a global community should never be underestimated because there will be someone listening and watching today who hears something in this program that becomes a key to their further recovery and living a best life or that might help them understand why their mind and thinking is the way that it is and it just it's a powerful vehicle and I want to keep having these conversations but what it takes is to is is both um an empathetic and engaged 
person to interview and someone who is brave and vulnerable to talk about this stuff because it's not easy it isn't so for both rev and i post this interview we will both have what is called a vulnerability hangover where we've talked about this and we will need quiet time and space to recoup and recover that's the cost absolutely of doing this work definitely and thank you so much for saying that because it isn't easy and you know I didn't even realize that that had been happening but I find you know I've talking about it isn't easy even though I know it is something I have to do and I but you've dealt with and you've moved on for when you tell that story there's a cost and and and, yes and, and, and I'm not I don't want to I don't want people to think that they shouldn't tell their stories. They just need to acknowledge that each time you give breath to that story, you conversely need to nurture your soul and acknowledge the healing and the process that you've been through. Take some quiet time, meditation, whatever it is that you do for self-care. Please make sure you do that audience and rev. I'm saying this to all of us today. Yeah, definitely. But we mustn't stop having these conversations. Yes, you know, absolutely. We must be able to have someone out there listening going, okay, there's hope. Okay, all is not lost. Okay, I can heal. Okay, I can deal. There's hope. And that's the purpose of what Rev does and will continue to do. And absolutely the purpose behind what I do is about hope, offering hope, offering understanding, compassion, our learnings, what work for us. And so talking about that, I want to know, um, Rev, what do you do for your own safety, peace of mind, and to look after you and your own mental health? When I first had my sort of awakening as such, I suppose you can call it, and that was mm. that realisation that, um, you know, I, I had everything within me to heal and and I because I'd spent so long running and, and in that survival mode that I I was looking externally for all for validation and for everything and for people to save me and all of that sort of stuff. And it wasn't until I sort of got back, you know, and centred myself and, and had this awakening that, yes, I've got everything that um, within me to, to heal. Mm-hmm. Um, I started to sort of get the help at that point. And um, for me, the my biggest um, thing was I found a psychologist who yeah. I could relate to. And I think I'd seen so many over the years and because I, we weren't on the same page or they didn't resonate with me. They didn't, it didn't really help. So I did have this idea that psychology wasn't for me, but I ended up finding this amazing lady who I connected with. um, And with her help, I started to unravel and unpack everything that had been happening. And the more I got to talk to her, I started to implement things that um, helped me. Meditation for one Mm -hmm. has been one of the biggest things um I know I need to meditate every day and and just having that time with myself um and my thoughts and and calming my thoughts and allowing myself to come back to that grounding where I'm you know more present as opposed to you know and acting out those thoughts has made a huge difference um in the way I relate to everyone around me, like it's made a massive impact. Um, So meditation has been one of the biggest things. I also journal, you were mentioning journaling journaling earlier. I journal, I don't journal every day, but I journal as a need arises. And sometimes it's just a matter of getting out of my head, whatever the crazy thoughts are going going on in there, getting them out and on paper. Um, So journaling has been huge part of my healing um I've I've taken up yoga I exercise all of the things that we know we should be doing and don't necessarily do and you struggle sometimes to do those things um and part of that that healing is knowing that you have to do those things that they become non-negotiables in your yes, life. Yes, and I think that's that's the biggest and realization. recognition that you yes. have to do those things that that, that are important. Um, one of the other points I wanted to make for the audience too is in finding a counselor or, or psychologist, you may need to talk to a number of people 
before yes. you find the, your person. Yeah. Um, that was my experience. I think I talked to six or seven, but I've had the same person for well over 10 years. And wow, yeah. And there will be periods of time where we are in almost constant uh, session and yes. there will be other vast periods of time where everything's fine. But I do, just like you go to a GP for a checkup, uh, my mind needs a checkup. And yes, absolutely. Going forward, it, it just, I used to resist it because I resisted getting help for decades and I still, there's moments of, oh, I don't need to go. But then when I do, I'm like, oh, yeah, probably should have yes. unpacked that or talked yep. through that or said, Definitely. this is what's going on. This is what I'm thinking. And the yeah. That third person's perspective is powerful, isn't it, Rev? It is. And I think when we are in survival mode, we do tend to avoid the things that are going to help us and that's just the way we, we're conditioned. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the healing journey is becoming aware of those moments that we are trying to avoid something and working out why, why are we avoiding what we know will help. And I yeah. think that's sort of been a big realisation for me. And, and it's Isn't helping me. Isn't that a key, me. Rev? Yes. When you, yes. Start to, when you start to avoid things, that's a tip off that um, what am I avoiding? Why am I avoiding? Okay, I need to circum. I need to put a circuit breaker in there now. Like, yes, get back absolutely. Into it. Yeah, and I think that's you know what it is about for me now. It is, and that's part of the healing. Is mm. like I don't, you know, I'm not perfect, and I still, you know, have lapses. And there's days where I don't want to meditate, and I won't. <laughs> But I will be like, why? Why am I doing I that? Why do you do the that to yourself? I yes. know. Those conversations yeah. still go on in your head. Like, yes. you know you need to meditate. Why are you not doing that? What are you avoiding? And then I get a little frustrated with myself. And then yes. and then yep. at some point I go, okay, just relax. Off you go. And I, it actually, for me, it actually goes back to those, those very early days when one of the best pieces of advice I got was around breath work and um, in that moment when um, I, I did, couldn't face anything or do anything or and suicide the th thoughts were beckoning one of the powerful things that I learned to do was breathe in and breathe out deeply and do it for a minute okay all I have to do for the next 60 seconds is breathe in breathe out okay 60 seconds, click, next 60 seconds, next 60 seconds, next 60. And before long, you've calmed your brain down because the, the brain is about protecting us and it's in survival, fight or flight mode. You need to get it out of that mode to be constructive and to get you to the next step. The best way I know to do that is breath work. It mm. takes you from primitive brain, fight or flight, survival mode and puts you back into cogn cognizance and understanding. Yes, um, definitely. Breath work has been, you know, a large part of my healing journey as well. Yeah. 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 And people just say, well, how could breath work be? But it is because if you can quiet the mind enough to just focus on that breathing in deeply and breathing out, it flips your brain from one part of the functioning brain to another part and then gets you on with next. And those simple things, never underestimate the power in those simple things. Yeah, definitely. And I think also it's really good for shifting energy as well, breath work. And that, you know, a lot of sometimes the trauma that we have, it's it's in our bodies. It's not necessarily you know, in our heads. So it is in we, our we bodies can, yeah, and... we can use breath work to, to shift that trauma and release it. And that's part of mm -hmm. the healing journey is releasing the trauma from your yeah. body. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes that might be um, uh, <laughs> one of my counsellors um, actually got me to get a, a pool noodle. And when I was in, in some pretty uh, anger and angry stages, she said, get that noodle and bang the bed yeah get the noodle and yes. bang the bed and go yeah I'm so angry about whatever yes. it was I was angry about 
and that disperses the anger. Yes, it releases it from your body so you're not carrying it anymore. Yeah, definitely a huge part of the healing, isn't it? Definitely, definitely. Um, I want to... um, just quickly go back to that conversation we had earlier about the intergenerational trauma um, and how the awareness of intergenerational trauma has caused you to think about the parenting of your own children. Yeah, because I went into survival mode, I think that, and as much as I said to myself, I'm not going to parent like my mother did, Mm -hmm. I ended up parenting exactly like my mother did. And so I believe early on that I was very controlling and um, it it was amazing to me to think that I was like that. And I just had no Mm -hmm. idea I was even like that. I was just this survival mode and I kept going and I ended up doing exactly what my mother did. And and I swore I wasn't going to be like that. And so yeah. it wasn't until I sort of had my mental breakdown in 2018 when everything just got too much for me. Yeah. Um, you know, th- all three of my children have had health issues and with yeah. the business, I, you know, I lived a very stressful life and yes. not having dealt with the trauma mm. when my mum passed away meant that I, you know, it was just the so body triggering. Keeps the having, score, doesn't yes, it? Yes. Yeah. And having children is the biggest trigger of all because oh, it makes you look at yourself in so many ways and I did not cope and I did not parent well and I you know I don't believe I I did a great job I loved my kids with all my heart and they know that I love them but But you're not going to be a perfect parent when you've got trauma in your background you are not going to get it right exactly you, you may as well just give yourself the 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 empathy to go okay, I'm going to do the very best I can. I'm going to love them unconditionally, but I'm not going to get this right. Yes, exactly. And and it is forgiving yourself as well because oh, yeah. you have to forgive yourself because you you just, we all just do the best with what we know and, um, and that's and all we can do. do better once you know exactly. better. Exactly, you once know? you become aware. And since that moment and, and part of my healing is that I have changed the way I parent and yeah. I'm less controlling, I am more open, yeah. I allow them to make their decisions a lot more um, and that has had a huge impact on my relationship with them and um, they're all doing a lot better and, yeah, it's amazing how, you know, I wish that I had this awakening a lot earlier yeah. but but I am grateful that, you know, I can I can make change now and I continue to do that. And I continue to learn how to do that. It's not yeah. it's not like you it's, wake up one day and think, oh, I know what to do yeah, now. Know. But now yeah. I, you know, I look for resources. I do reading. You know, I'm constantly trying to improve the way I parent and improve myself. Yeah. And I think yeah. part of that realisation was that I don't need to fix my children. No. I need to heal myself. And that's yes. all I can do. And in healing yourself. You heal your children. Exactly. I'm not sure if the audience understands the power that can be generated by doing your own healing first and Absolutely. foremost. The more you yeah. heal, the more you heal your children and the generations that follow. It's a yes. powerful piece of why you go on a healing journey. Absolutely. And there, you know, let's acknowledge that there are some people that never heal and deal. They never do, and, and that that's their journey, and that's that's their decision, either conscious or unconscious. But those of us that want to be our best selves will embark on healing and dealing, and in doing so, there is a ripple effect across the globe, and there was a powerful impact on generations that follow us. Yeah, absolutely. Rev, um, before we run out of time, I quickly want you to tell the audience um, about the book, where they can find it, um, uh, how they can connect with you um, and the best way to connect with you. Um, the best way to connect with me is on Instagram. My account is Days of My Life by Rev, which is the title of my book as well, which is Days of My Life um, by Rev Alford. Um, the links to purchase my memoir is in my bio on Instagram. So that's probably the best place to find Instagram. me. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm continually trying to open up a dialogue around mental health and that's my biggest passion and I, and I use that Absolutely. account to do that. Yeah. 
Rev, we will have all of those links attached to this interview. Um, I just want to pay quick tribute to you and thank you for coming on the show today, for talking about such difficult subjects and opening the conversation about mental health and trauma. I believe that you have a powerful place in this universe and in this life and I'm grateful to be connected to you and wonderful to be able to interview you today. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me and and I feel the same about you and it was just such an honour to come on and finally meet you and chat with you and, yeah, I really felt a great connection today. So thank you so much. Um, number one, again, passionate about all of these topics and continuing to have those conversations. Um, finally, in, um, audience, thank Rev for being on the show today. And that, my friends, is your lot for this week. If anything in this show has triggered something within you, please reach out to someone. Please chat to someone. And if you want to know more, please connect with Rev. Please go out and buy her book if you're thinking about or wanting to understand intergener intergenerational trauma from a real perspective please buy the book and we will be back next week with another amazing author and that is all for this week bye for now it's not about the book it's about the person you come on the other side of writing the book. what sort of book it is it can be a business book it can be a memoir it can be anything it can be a children's book the process of writing will change your life.